In June of 2018, Boston area anesthesiologist Jaleesa Jackson and Chidozi Iwandu decided on a week's vacation in Southern California. 29-year-old Jaleesa and 28-year-old Chidozi had met while studying at the prestigious Johns Hopkins University of Medicine down in Baltimore and were already an item by the time they moved up to Boston together. Their personal life was hallmarked by a deeply loving romantic relationship, but their professional lives were deeply stressful, with each routinely working 14-hour shifts either five or six days a week, and even on their days off they were sometimes called into work to conduct essential medical procedures. Each of them found this lifestyle to be utterly exhausting, so when it came time to pick a vacation spot, they chose a place as far away from Boston as they possibly could, Los Angeles. After traveling 3,000 miles across the country, they checked into a small oceanside guest house they'd rented via Airbnb. The place had some truly excellent reviews, and its owner was so popular with those that rented from him that the company had designated him a super host, meaning he provided almost flawless customer service while making himself easily available to those that stayed at the property. Waiting for them at the property was a chilled bottle of wine, along with a friendly welcome note from the owner, who referred to themselves as JJ. He wished them a delightful stay, thanked them for their custom, then left his contact details just in case they needed anything. Then, feeling like they were in safe hands, Jaleesa and Chidozi packed away their things, then settled in for the night. They believed that they were in for a dream vacation, the perfect anecdote to their high-pressure, career-driven lives. Yet little did they know, their vacation would turn into a living nightmare. Around 5.30 the next morning, the couple woke up to the sound of a loud and violent banging sound coming from the front door. The commotion just about frightened the life out of them, but a brave Jaleesa grabbed her phone, readied herself to call 911, then approached the front door to see what was going on. As she got closer, she heard a rough male voice barking. I know you're in there, Kevin. Julie appeared through the door's peephole, spying an unhinged, enraged man on the other side, and after barking at him to get away from the property, she decided to call JJ to let him know what was going on. But then, just as the dial tone started, the sound of a phone ringing could be heard from the other side of the door. Jaleesa then opened the door, looked the man dead in the face, and asked, JJ? Yet the man simply looked up at her with a startled look on his face, then ran off into the night. As you can imagine, Jaleesa was horribly confused, as was Chidozi when the details of the incident were relayed to him. Then, demanding an answer, Jaleesa began calling JJ incessantly until he finally answered his phone. JJ seemed completely unapologetic regarding the bizarre incident and told Jaleesa, Yeah, that was me. Sorry about the confusion, but that's too short for me to give you an explanation. Have a nice time in LA. Jaleesa tried to fish for more of an explanation, bemused and outraged that a so-called super host, who had seemed so warm and friendly in their welcome note, had turned out to be anything but. Yet before she had a chance to ask him anything... JJ hung up on her. Maybe things are just different on the West Coast, Jaleesa told Chidozi in an attempt to explain JJ's bizarre and alarming behavior, and both agreed that it certainly made for a memorable welcome to one of the United States' most famous cities. The couple then spent the day at a nearby beach, and by the time the sun began to set, that morning's incident was almost completely forgotten. When they were done at the beach, Jaleesa and Chidozi made their way back to their Airbnb, with the remainder of their evening being pleasantly uneventful. They finished off the rest of their wine, ate some of the best tacos they'd ever eaten in their lives, then sank into bliss while enjoying a saccharine rom-com courtesy of Netflix. It was only after they'd retired to bed did the terror ramp up exponentially. Shortly after 2 o'clock in the morning, the couple was scared out of their skin when a hooded figure literally came crashing through the large window of their darkened bedroom. The violent intrusion sent shards of glass everywhere, and both halves of the couple let out screams of terror as the figure smashed their way into the bedroom. I had no idea what was happening, Chidozi recalled, but I reacted like we were under attack. In an instant, 
The 230-pound six-foot Shidozi leapt on the man as he simply lay there motionless on the bedroom floor. He tore up his bare feet on the broken glass in the process, but the surging adrenaline meant he barely felt it. In that moment, all that mattered was securing and detaining the maniacal intruder so that they wouldn't be free to harass them again. As he shoved his knee into the intruder's back, Chidozi screamed at Jalisa to call 911. He later said that he'd feared that the man might be hiding a weapon, or that more intruders might be attempting to force their way into the residence. As Jalisa grabbed her phone and rushed to call 911, her boyfriend barked at her to hide under the table, just in case any other armed men were about to burst into the bedroom. As she did so, Jalisa made a mental note of the man's attire, the goal of which was to provide as accurate a description as possible to the emergency dispatcher. Yet when she tried to get a look at his face, and as the hood of his jacket began to work its way back from his face, she noticed something that instantly sent chills through her. JJ? She called out, recognizing their so-called super host as the man who had just smashed his way into their bedroom. Chidozi was so shocked by his girlfriend's cry that he took his knee off of JJ's back, turning him over to confirm that the person terrorizing them was actually their apparent benevolent landlord. At the moment he loosened his grip, JJ tore himself free, then bolted from the building as fast as his legs could carry him. Minutes later, Jaleesa Jackson was telling the police that they had just been attacked by their own Airbnb host and that he had gone crazy and that they needed assistance as soon as possible. Then, while awaiting the arrival of armed officers, Jaleesa and Chidozi armed themselves with the biggest kitchen knives, then hunkered down in preparation for another assault. Yet while they waited, they suddenly heard the sounds of a helicopter hovering overhead. Then moments later, the courtyard between the guest house and the main house was awash with flashing lights. Jaleesa then noticed two police officers leading a handcuffed man back towards the property. It was JJ, and he was ranting and raving about cleaning fees. He had apparently told the police that he had ordered his tenants to move out after they failed to pay cleaning fees, but as commotion unfolded, an elderly woman emerged from the main house and asked what was going on. It turned out that the woman was the property's true owner, and that she had rented the guest house out to JJ on the condition that he wouldn't sublet it from anyone else. Jaleesa and Chidozi told her that, as far as they knew, JJ rented the place out all the time and that it was in fact his primary source of income. They asked her how she hadn't noticed all the people coming and going with luggage, but the woman meekly replied that she thought that they were all just JJ's friends. Thankfully, after placing a few calls to Airbnb, the company refunded the couple the full $708 they had paid to rent the guest house, and also offered to relocate them to another property at no additional cost. However, due to the trauma they'd experienced, Jaleesa and Chidozi had no desire to patronize Airbnb in the future, and checked into a local Hilton hotel, even though it cost them an additional $2,300 to do so. In the aftermath, they sought $5,000 worth of compensation from Airbnb, owing to the terror and trauma they'd experienced. But after a period of intense haggling with the company's grievance department, the best offer they could get was two and a half grand. Airbnb did offer to sweeten the deal by paying for five therapy sessions for each of the couple, which they argued would tip the total compensation amount to well over $5,000, but Jaleesa and Chidozi refused. If you think that seems extremely miserly of Airbnb, you'd be right, as according to Forbes magazine, the company is worth around $38 billion, with an annual revenue of just over $2 billion. Almost every single night, a jaw-dropping 2 million people stay in Airbnb properties in over 8,000 cities around the world, so surely, they have the revenue to properly compensate a couple who went through something so horrific and traumatic. And for a company whose entire business model is based on trust, and who proclaims your safety is our priority, the incident in LA shows a chilling failure of Airbnb's screening system. The company itself has claimed that no screening system is perfect, but while this remains the case, couples like Jaleesa and Chidozi will continue to be at the mercy of crooks and villains who only wish to prey on their fellow man.
I opened up my home as an Airbnb, and within the first month I ended up unlisting it from the website and scrapping the entire idea. You see, my wife and I have been trying to sell our old home for over a year before we decided to turn it into an Airbnb, so we didn't really have strict rules about the place. As long as it was kept nice and the guests cleaned up after themselves, our plan was to let anyone stay there for as long as they needed to. The only thing that we did when we listed the house was get a single security camera that we placed in plain view at the entrance of the house facing the front door. That way we could see anyone who entered the home. Now the first two guests that we hosted were so friendly and kept the house very clean, so my wife and I were actually very excited that we decided to take a chance on renting out our old home. That quickly changed though when one day I checked the camera after our third set of guests had supposedly left. They finished up their booking and when it was done, we got the text that they had left the key on the counter and we thanked them for their business. When I checked the camera, however, I noticed that was facing the opposite direction and all I could see was the wall behind it. I called my wife, who was still at work, and let her know that I was going to be running over to the old home to check on it and fix the camera. And then I got into my truck and made my way down the road. The house that we listed for Airbnb was only about 25 minutes from the house that we currently lived in, so I got there in no time. However, it was around 7.30 at night, so the driveway was pretty dark when I pulled into it. I figured that they must have just turned the porch light off and forgot to turn it back on before leaving. Again, it was no big deal, but I definitely noticed how dark it was. I carefully made my way up the gravel path and to the front door of the house, and this is where things took a serious turn. As I reached out for the handle, the door ended up swinging open on its own without me even touching it. I was really confused by that, so I took a second before walking inside, but as I looked into the house, I couldn't see anything unusual. Eventually, I mustered up the courage and made my way through the threshold and into the home. That was when I felt something hard hit me from behind. I dropped to my knees and then turned around as fast as I could to see what had hit me. And that was when I saw someone standing in my house holding something in their hand that looked like a bat or pole of some sort. I put my hands up in front of my face to protect myself from any incoming attack, but that was when I was grabbed from behind by another assailant. They pulled me to the ground and held me there as the man who struck me in the back began digging through my pockets. They pulled my phone, my keys, and my wallet out of my pocket before letting me go. But I didn't even get to pick myself off the ground before I was struck over the head with a bat again. Everything around me went black as I fell back to the ground. I woke up a couple of hours later to my wife who was shaking me awake. She said that an ambulance was on the way and that she had come to check on me after she got home from work and noticed that I still wasn't back. My wife also told me that my car wasn't in the driveway and I knew right away that they had stolen it. After the ambulance came, I told my wife to call the police and to cancel the cards that we had in my wallet. I ended up needing three stitches on my forehead where I had been hit by the one assailant, and according to the police, there was no evidence that would help us find them. They never even found my car. We immediately chose to unlist the house from Airbnb and just try to continue to sell it. So, I've owned an Airbnb for quite a few years now. It wasn't a big home, just enough where you can maybe have two or three people over. However, my house is located right near Miami Beach with a nice area, so it was common for people to take notice. Ever since the pandemic had started to die down, my house got booked several times as life began to get back to normal. I didn't mind it though, as I made decent money due to the location and condition. Normally, I'd receive several bookings wanting to use my house for parties and whatnot. Just a few weeks ago, however, I had gotten an older couple who just wanted it for a few nights together. It wasn't a bad thing, but rather surprising considering it was just two people. I'd like to mention that I rarely see or communicate with the people who use the house unless they needed something. Anyway, it had been day two of this day and I was at my girlfriend's apartment having dinner when my phone goes off. I look at it and see that it's the couple texting me. I could only assume it was bad news and I opened the message to them telling me that there was a leak in the water heater. 
This was weird, as I make sure everything in the house is in pristine condition when booked. However, no running water was unacceptable, and I'd tell my girlfriend that I'd be back and that I was going to fix it. Upon arriving to the house, I immediately noticed that there were now two cars in the driveway. Figuring that they must have had people over, I dismiss it even though it wasn't really allowed. I go inside the house and the husband tells me that there's a water heater leak in the garage. I politely tell him that I'd get it fixed and that he had nothing to worry about. We head to the garage and he shows me where the leak was and points to the nut from where the water goes through. However, the so-called problem he was complaining about was something a person without a brain could easily fix. The bolts of the water heater had been loosened and was far from broken. As a matter of fact, I could now see one of my wrenches sitting on top of the heater, indicating that this was done on purpose. It was then when I started to get an uncomfortable feeling as the man just stood there staring at me. I take the wrench and tighten the screw, stopping the leaking water. Uh, well, it's fixed. Enjoy the rest of your stay. He then profusely tells me to wait and asks if I could help him with one last thing. He tells me that there was something wrong with the cable in the guest bedroom. Now, the guest bedroom is upstairs, and when I looked at it, I noticed that it was completely dark up there. He gestures me to go first, to which I tell him why. He then tells me that it was my house and that he didn't want to be rude. I hesitantly walk slowly up the stairs toward the dark hallway. As I'm about halfway up the stairs, I can very faintly see someone standing at the top of the stairs staring down at me. Even through the pitch darkness, I can see this person holding something with a shade of yellow. It only took me another few seconds to realize that it was a crowbar. I stop dead in my tracks and turn around and tell him that I had to go, but that I'd be back later. However, instead of persuading me to go upstairs, he simply stared toward me and said nothing as I left the house. At this point, I'm inside of my car on the phone with the police telling them the situation. I didn't go back to my house until the police gave me the update, which eventually of course they did. Upon arrival, they were shocked to find that nobody was there and no signs of any damage. The only things that were stolen was a flower vase my mom had given me and the TV. Needless to say, I stopped using that house as an Airbnb as I didn't want to take any chances. Miami police were never able to identify who these people were or where they were. While it was a sucky situation, three questions still remain unanswered. What were their intentions? Who was holding that crowbar? And what would have happened had I gone up the stairs? It gives me goosebumps till this day. This took place in 2019 in my last semester of college. My friends and I had just finished finals and decided we would go on a road trip for a few days. Since hotel prices were through the roof, we decided we would rent an Airbnb instead. This took place right by the coast of Cali, so you could imagine how nice it was. The house we were staying at was a beach house and had all the decor of anything that was related to a beach. On top of that, the house was really nice and kept clean. For the first few nights, everything went well with no problems. However, that was until our last night there, when we were all asleep except for me. Throughout my life, I've always had trouble sleeping. I wasn't sure why, but whatever the reason was went into my adulthood and stuck with me ever since. As I'm rolling around in my bed, I hear footsteps in the kitchen. The floors of this house were made of wood, so it was easy to hear someone. Assuming it was probably one of my friends, I dismiss it until I realized that there was something off. 
These footsteps sounded way too heavy, and out of curiosity, I opened my door, and what I saw nearly gave me a heart attack. Standing about six feet away was a large man dressed in all black. The minute they see me, they run across the house and out the back door. My screaming woke up the rest of my friends, and we called the police. However, given that it was dark out with the lights off, I couldn't give a good description other than he was tall. The police would eventually find this person, as it turns out that he had broken into several houses in the area. Needless to say, we ended our stay early and went back home the same night. One of the strangest Airbnbs that I ever experienced wasn't actually a standalone house, but instead it was a room in this large house. The host had listed four different rooms on Airbnb, and then all of the guests just shared the large common area. It wasn't too bad to get used to on my first day there. I mean, sure it was weird to share a house with strangers, but because I was on a road trip by myself and only needed a single room for a few days, it seemed like a sweet deal. Now the one thing that stood out to me when I met the host and the person who lived in the master bedroom was that they claimed no place in the house was off limits except for the basement. He seemed very adamant that none of us go near the basement. That didn't seem like it would be a problem for me and honestly I wasn't even remotely interested in what was down there because I was so focused on the woods that surround the large house that the host owned. It seemed like the perfect place to go for a hike or ride quads. I was really jealous that they got to live there full time. At least, that was the case at first. I started feeling a lot less comfortable once I noticed that the host seemed to follow me around everywhere I went. It was something I could let slide at first though, considering I was a guest in his house. That changed when he approached me in the kitchen on my second night there though. I was sitting at the kitchen table drinking a glass of water and scrolling through my phone when I noticed the host walk over to me and stare down as if he wanted to talk. So I put my phone down and asked him how his night was going. And without a moment's notice, he began to raise his voice at me. He claimed that he saw me looking at the door to the basement and very loudly told me that it was his private space and to leave it alone. I tried to explain to him that I didn't even know which door was in the basement, but he didn't want to hear it and just continued yelling at me. I ended up apologizing to the host just to get him to calm down and then I ended up going into my room for the night. As time passed, I had a hard time falling asleep in my room after that altercation. And just as I was about to pass out, I heard the sound of someone knocking on the door of the room next to mine. I listened closely as one of the other guests answered. I could hear the host ask them to follow him, and I just decided to ignore it and continue to go to sleep. However, before I could manage to do that, I heard another noise. Only this time it was one that I'm pretty sure the entire house could hear. Someone was clearly screaming at the top of their lungs on the first floor. At first I was frozen with fear from the bone-chilling scream. But as the shrieking continued, I knew that I had to check it out. I wasn't alone in my curiosity though. As I entered the hall, I saw another guest that was staying at the house peeking out of her room as well. The screaming continued as I walked through the hall and made my way down the stairs. And as I reached the first floor, I realized something that truly haunts me still. The screaming was coming from the basement. I decided that I needed to get help for whoever was down there and ended up running back upstairs and grabbed my phone. I called the police as fast as I could and then quickly got the other guest out of the house. As we sat in the driveway waiting for the police to come, the screaming ended up stopping. I locked my eyes on the house to make sure that the owner wasn't coming out, and I practically jumped out of my skin when I noticed the silhouette of a man standing at the window staring out at us. They slowly backed away from the window and disappeared into the darkness of the house. I watched the door as I fully expected the owner to come out and attack us or something, but thankfully the police showed up before anything like that happened. I explained to the officers what had happened and they quickly rushed into the house and made their way to the basement. However, what was really shocking was the fact that the house was supposedly empty. When they checked the entire place out, they couldn't find anyone. All they saw was that the back door to the home was left wide open as if the owner had run out the back and into the woods. After giving our statements to the police, we were all escorted inside to get our belongings and then we all went our separate ways. To this day, I don't know who was screaming in that basement or where they went, but I can't help but shake the feeling that something horrible happened in that house that night. 
My sister and I have never been on a holiday together, just the two of us. We went several times with our mom together. My parents are divorced, but my mother was the stressful kind of holiday planner. Cultural tours here, a day-long bus trip there, and back on the plane we are again. So we decided to book a five-day trip to a place we'd never been to. The both of us never can stand being at a place for more than a week. It just gets boring and we are restless adventurers. We traveled with Airbnb for the first time and the place was amazing. It was on the top floor of the building with a huge balcony from which you could look down on the intersection till the end of each street. One street led directly to the port. If you followed it down past tennis courts and some parking lots from hotels around a curve, my sister and I always went out for dinner. The seafood was great and as the days passed, we explored further and further away from our apartment for new restaurants. On the last day, we found a place that served sea urchin, which was about 45 minutes away from home. Greek people are so friendly. When you eat lunch or dinner, dessert is always free and they set you up with rocky, a very strong, and for me as an inexperienced drinker, painful, little brandy that packs a punch if you finish it quickly. This being the fifth day already, I couldn't stand drinking more than one shot glass, so I left the rest of the small bottle to my sister. She said it would be rude to leave a gift. She can also handle a lot more alcohol than me. We left the place stuffed and with satisfied thirst, walking along the port home to our place. The streets are always full of tourists, but only until the curve I mentioned before. Once you reach the tennis courts, there are about 200 meters up street to the intersection where our house is. What we didn't expect were that a group of gypsies set up their night camp on the parking lots in the light of the tennis court. If you are not aware of the situation, Greece is overall a landing port for refugees and gypsies, although we didn't see many of them around Heraklion. I felt uneasy because we were the only two girls in the street, besides the group of people getting ready to sleep. My sister was a little happy from the alcohol when I suddenly heard shuffling steps behind me. I could see the shadow of a skinny but tall man. I listened closely to his steps. He was still far enough away from me so that he couldn't suddenly grab me, but I felt very uneasy as I was wearing high platforms and directing my sister in front of me. He starts picking up the pace, clearly trying to adjust his walking to our pace. Hey, hi. I don't answer him. He comes up to my right. Hi. I size him up, skinny but muscular. There is something wrong with his leg. His hip seems to be limping. Nope, not the kind of person I'd like to talk to in the middle of the night. My sister asks me, Who is that? I don't know, keep walking. He passes me and tries to speak to my sister, maybe thinking she would be easier to convince because she looks drunkish. He starts speaking in a foreign language, which we obviously don't speak. She sheepishly tells him, What? English. Uh, we only speak English. I run up to my sister and pull her with me onto the street. Don't talk to him. Keep moving. That's when he tries to grab her by the arm and pull her back. I am tense at this moment. With a face of, don't you touch my sister, I step up to the guy and shove him with my hands in the chest and shout at him, No! Because of his limp, he stumbles backwards. I keep looking at him when I take the hand of my sister and walk faster. That's when he starts grinning. Oh. Finally we reach the intersection and run into the house. The front door is always open so I hurriedly get my sister into the elevator into the third floor. My sister is clearly shaken up from the guy trying to grab her, but rather angry than scared. We lock the door and leave the lights out. From the balcony we can see the guy walking into the entrance of our house, in and out for at least an hour before he finally left.